the host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joining us as he does every day at this time. And we have a lot of conversations here about maybe the end of globalization, but more importantly, yeah. how our relationship with China is right now, particularly when it comes to investment. Yeah, exactly. Second largest economy yeah. in the world, maybe the most important relationship for the United States economically around the world. And you remember, Romain, coming out of the G7, they talk, we want to de-risk, we don't want to decouple. Uh -huh. So we talked to have Sonny Can you do both? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the question. Yeah. What's okay. the difference, by yeah, the yeah. way? Because I'm not yeah. sure. We talked to have Sonny Beschlesch. She's the CEO of Rock Creek. And we talked to her exactly what is the difference between decoupling and de-risking. I think there is the political language, David, and that certainly is getting a little softer, moving from decoupling to de-risking. But also de-risking is something that uh, a lot of the world leaders have been thinking about, um, not just in the G7, but beyond the G7 since COVID, when supply chains got, um, got into serious um, infrastructure delays. And so in that sense, the de-risking is a softer word for politicians to use, but it also reflects the reality in the sense that you did not want, whether you're looking at COVID vaccines or you are looking at medication and pharmaceuticals or food and agriculture products on one source of supply. And of course, today we're talking about the same thing when it comes to uh, microchips. It's a really important distinction. It's not just we're against China in some sense. We just need to diversify our supply chain, something we did start talking about with the pandemic and medical supplies. You go around the world looking at investments. You talk to all of these companies. How far along are we in that process? I think what you're seeing is a couple of forces um, uh, at work. One is uh, the fact that labor has become expensive in China, right? So Chinese companies themselves had already, even before a lot of these uh, conflicts got into this level of decibel, uh, started to start their, start their new plans outside of China to reduce labor costs. Obviously, with geopolitics and French shoring, that has continued. And you're seeing that also with U.S. companies. U.S. companies, because of French shoring, but also diversifying uh, their sources, are looking at other places, whether it is closer to home or it is in ASEAN countries. And ASEAN is sort of uh, set up to really be a big beneficiary of what is going on in the supply chain and, uh, and this sort of new de-risking uh, language, because it will benefit if China is growing. It will benefit if China is also not growing from what is happening with French shoring. Uh, so I think um, you are already seeing the divergence in in um, in having more sources of the same good starting at company levels, but also politically. Absolutely. We now have a new hot topic in town, and it's called AI, particularly generative AI. Uh, put a, a generative AI against the Chinese-U.S. Uh, relationship, if you would. Uh, it clearly is a big thing. It's on the way. On the one hand, it seems to connect us more closely. On the other hand, it raises real security concerns. So I think on the, um, on the positive side, when you're talking about the risking, David, it's with open AI, we know that no country can be completely decoupled from another. And um, and what AI is allowing is, um, is on the one hand, having data uh, be used to to generate uh, intelligence and, and and be and be used in different ways. And with open AI, you're starting to see so much attention right now on how do you regulate the data flows, and and um, and today there was all the conversations that were going on, in terms of the European regulation being um, being uh, more restrictive uh, regarding uh, U.S. companies. So there's no question that when it comes to China, U.S., there is a lot that is uh, going to be at work with open AI, and I think it, that will be one reason that I am. Hope, hopeful that the two sides will be more will be cooperating more. Now there are security issues because with OpenAI also comes um, comes bad um, bad actors because just like good actors can use OpenAI to improve education or improve trade or improve um, you know delivery of work products. Uh, it also is something that bad actors at, in, at the government level or outside of governments can use and do damage. When you talk about government regulation, one of the things that is pending right now in Washington, as I understand, is possible restrictions on outbound investment from the United States into China. Where do you understand that sits and what effects could that have, 
have on China and specifically Chinese growth? So I think the uh, the impact of uh, of U.S. regulation could be serious because also we saw, for example, when there was a language put um, in front of Congress, I think it was in March, about uh, changing the definition of PRC not being a developing country, which would mean that it could not benefit from uh, loans from uh, from multilaterals, for example, U.S. investors are not investing so much in China as we speak. And in fact, most of them have started reducing their um, capital flows into China. So what you've seen is foreign direct investments into China have uh, fallen by quite a large amount. And um, and that could continue moving forward. So, so Afsana, you are an investor. And at this point, given the, the degree of interconnection, it, it probably doesn't even make sense about not investing in China. So if you're going to invest in China, given the circumstances you've just described, what's the smartest way to invest in China right now? So you're absolutely right. China is a 19 trillion economy. It is, a, you know, second largest um, economy in the world. And it will remain important. And I think what you want to do is really look at the local, uh, local side, because you have 1.2 billion in population um, and, um, and they're consuming goods, investing much more in stocks that are based on local growth uh, in China. So I think that is uh, interesting. And then, of course, you can invest uh, in, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in ASEAN countries and in Japan, because those are also beneficiaries of, uh, of the Chinese uh, coming out of the uh, COVID uh, thought that they were in. And as they grow, even though you know the growth may not be 6%, it may be closer to 5%, there's still a lot of opportunities. Last but not least, I think the private side of things is definitely not an area where investors from outside China are going. And they're concentrating more on liquid markets versus private markets so that you don't tie up capital for a long time.